It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Varginis Konarski in the Polish House. Once again, uh, he's been here for a couple of times already. Professor Konarski był już w Domu Polskim kilka razy. Um, he was one of the first uh, people who actually wrote, wrote something about, about, about Ireland, about Irish, um, about the Polish living in, in Ireland. And uh, was that in... Uh, in the 80s? It was 1991, 91. In, the, in the weekly called Razem, which doesn't exist anymore. And since then, since then, uh, he started to write about, about Ireland. Um, and I had a pleasure, under uh, direction of Professor Kornowski, to, to, to finish my uh, doctoral thesis, my doctoral dissertation, about Ireland's Irish political system. And then since then, there was a, a lot of more um, Irish-related uh, uh, subjects and, and, and books. Uh, Professor, um, Konarski, as I mentioned, um, uh, for a long time had a great interest in uh, about Ireland, uh, and then today we will hear about a comparative examination of post Easter Rising Ireland and post Great War Poland selected socio-political aspects. Um, today's um, today's lecture will be uh, in English, but partly will be in Polish. Also, at the end, we'll have a Polish corner, so for those of you who uh, might have a slight uh, problem with the difficult uh, vocabulary which will be heard today, uh, we will be translating uh, at the end, um, just uh, on the very end of, the, of this row. Um, I'd just like to remind you about switching off your phones. Proszę Państwa, dzisiejszy wykład będzie w języku angielskim głównie, ale będziemy też dawać wstawki polskie. Natomiast z tyłu jest kącik polski, gdzie będziemy tłumaczenie takie ciche i symultaniczne państwu, państwu przedstawiać. Profesor jest znawcą tematyki irlandzkiej od, od wielu lat. Jest autorem wielu publikacji na temat, na temat o tematyce irlandzkiej. I cóż, to, to chyba tyle. Nie jest pierwszy raz w Domu Polskim, był tu już kilka, co najmniej kilka razy. Jest w tej chwili profesorem zwyczajnym, nadzwyczajnym na Uniwersytecie Jagiellońskim i wykłada też w Akademii Listura. W Akademii Listura. To tyle z mojej strony. Zostawiam, zostawiam salę panu profesorowi Kątowskiemu. Dziękuję bardzo. I promise to be as communicative as I can. First of all, thank you so much to everyone who decided of course, to come and to meet me tonight. I'm very happy to be always in this place, in this town, and of course in this country. Uh, I must say my pleasure is to be, of course, uh, one of the pioneer uh, researchers as far as the any sort of the social, political, and cultural, and okay, and historical research. Uh, covering the uh, Irish history and politics uh, uh, consent. Uh, first of all, let me mention just a very few words about the, my professional career. I, uh, for most time of my research career, which I started in the beginning of the of 80s, I was working in several uh, Polish universities, mostly at the University of Warsaw, and uh, since 2010, I, I'm permanently employed and tenured professor there of the University of Jagiellonia in Krakow, uh, which is very interesting, first of all, comparison with the, some Irish aspect as well, because as we know, uh, in Poland we have a sort of the competition in terms of the cultural or intellectual life between Warsaw and Krakow. I would say this is perhaps not the same, but quite similar to Dublin and Cork. So okay. I think. This one thing is also something which I, we can see uh, something which is in common between our, our two countries and uh, anything which will concern also my lecture today because I like very much as a political scientist to concentrate on some of the combative aspects of uh, politics and history. Um, I have published uh, oh, quite many, let's say more than 50 or even 60 different works about Ireland and uh, I concentrated mostly on the Irish history and politics in the last 200 years. Uh, let me also mention, perhaps it will be interesting for you as well, that I, I published in 1992 as the first ever poll the uh, history of the Irish Republican Army written in Polish for the Polish audience. And after that I continued my, my research of the Irish political system 
and the history, uh, as I said, in last 200 years, but the, I focused my attention mostly on the independent island, so which started, of course, after the Anglo-Irish Treaty and with the proclamation of the Irish Free State in 1922. So, in fact, I concentrated my, uh, my doctoral thesis and afterwards postdoctoral thesis as well uh, on the Irish uh, issues concerning the Irish party system. Uh, and I underlined the special role, in fact, the predominant role of the Fianna Foil as a party which has always been very interesting for me as a party which changed completely its image from the radical national republicanism into the more or less moderate conservatism, as it was called some time, as a Mediterranean conservatism, which I like very much as an expression. And uh, after that, I also published uh, some other books. And uh, uh, one, I think, seems to be most important. It is the, my own analysis of the Irish nationalism, as it has been seen from the perspective of last 200 years, starting from the uh, more or less uh, Theobald Wolf Thorn uh, United Irishmen Society until the proclamation of, uh, of the uh, independent island and continuing the whole story until the Good Friday Agreement and slightly afterwards. So this is quite a large book which uh, I analyzed, in which I analyzed all the aspects in my mind most important, especially certain divisions inside of this movement which I recognize as division into the pragmatic and uh, doctrinal or ideologized uh, wings, more or less. Today's lecture I decided to devote to some of the specific analyses concerning the uh, Irish and Polish uh, history, mostly uh, perceived from the uh, 20th century time, but since we are having, you have in Ireland, and, and we are also slightly involved in this historical debate because of the 90, uh, 90 anniversary, 90 years anniversary of the coup d'etat of Marshal Pilsudski. So we may have also some comparative approach to the uh, historizing as the very important uh, event in the Irish modern history, together with the, with the Marshal Pilsudski role who is sometimes compar comparable with, uh, with uh, Eamon de Valera. Uh, and I think, uh, although of course not on the same scale, because uh, Marshal Wysotsky, in fact, he abandoned the legal government in 1926, whereas Eamon de Valera has been always a strongly democratically oriented person, but of course with certain authoritarian approach on his own. Namely, he was very strongly authoritarian type of the politician, although he was always involved in the democratic procedures. Even despite the fact that Sean Lemas, as you perhaps know, definitely know, after the establishment of Fiera Foil, proclaimed openly that we are political party, we are slightly, we are slightly uh, constitutional party. This is a very interesting expression which fits in my mind very easily and very nicely in the contemporary situation in Poland. Because we have right now a really important time, because there is a new government, Russian government, which is doing, in my mind, quite similar uh, things to these which happened upon the 1926 up to 1930, after we started to uh, go further or straight forward towards the uh, less democratic system, because we, in fact, did have a system which I call sometimes as a mild authoritarian like system namely uh, after Marshal Piłsudski put it up. And Piłsudski, of course, is a hero for our, our most important right-wing politician, Mr. Kaczynski, who is uh, following his line in terms of the other semi politics. But let me start with the first slide. What I like uh, from some of the expressions, which I think we should bear in mind the expression of T.G. Curtin, who calls Poland a sweet island of the East, Mm -hmm. Very interesting expression, and my presumption after that is why not to call Ireland as a big part of the West? <laughs> uh, this will be, yes? Can I just interrupt? It's very interesting that you should mention it. Um, we came across history of a Polish priest 
that actually landed in Ireland in the 19th century, and uh, he actually described the, the, the newspapers at uh, the time called Ireland Poland of the West. Yes, so that's true, that's true, of course. I mean, if you want to provoke me with some, some uh, references to history, of course, what I like very much is the very famous uh, oration uh, presented once by Robert Wolf Thun, who addressed uh, directly to Kościuszko uprising, after, after he has been, of course, uh, accused uh, and sentenced to death. So uh, there are some interesting Polish-Irish parallels in history, which, of course, definitely should be mentioned and remembered. So let's go further. So I think that, first of all, I should mention some of the most interesting historical similarities. Definitely they might be selected, because as you might imagine, it's impossible to uh, provide you with all of the knowledge about that in about one hour time. But <clears throat> Catholicism is, a, first of all, a very important uh, issue, which is a denomination basis for the national identity in Poland and Ireland. The second issue is a tradition of constant struggle with the foreign domination and unfortunately defeated military risings, which I think is very typical for the Polish historical and political tradition lies entirely in the fact that uh, most Polish uprisings were unfortunately defeated, but all of them, although not on the equal basis, which is quite important, are celebrated by Poles until now. And ironically, the only one uprising which was uh, quite uh, successful in terms, or let's say, if we look upon it in a comparative perspective, the uprising of 1918 and 1919 in Great Poland, in Wielkopolska, in Poznań, in Durand, which was successful, is still, uh, it is remembered like the others, but not on the same level. This is, I mean, strange and ironic, because this was the only one successful uprising we used to have in the Polish history against the foreign domination. In that special case, it was the domination taken or observed from the Prussian or German side. Because this uprising has been organized against the, against the German rule in the western part of Poland during the partition times, which started in 1795. So, surprisingly, we are to a certain extent a nation which celebrates mostly, unfortunately, those uprisings which were in fact defeated, unfortunately. So, this is again similarity between Poland and Ireland. Other issues the peripheral location of uh, both countries within the continent of Europe. The third issue is large significance of emigration factor in the last almost 200 years. And the similar time of the independence status proclamation, which in fact we may observe in those four years, between 1918 up to 1922, if we compare Poland to Ireland. But there are also very many, not very often mentioned, historical differences between Ireland and Poland. And this is, of course, my own analysis. You may disagree with this analysis, but I think that it is more or less rather true. First of all, we did have, we are familiar with the 750 years or more of the island's dependent status from, uh, from England and after the, from, from Britain. But in the Polish case, in fact, we lost independence for about 123 years. And I, take, I have in mind the third partition, namely 795. Because until that time, we were more or less having our own territory, but after that, we were completely erased from the map of Europe. And uh, what is also important that Ireland was dependent on England and Britain as the entity. The whole island was dependent on the uh, English and British rule. In case of Poland, we partitioned into the three foreign uh, dominant uh, superpowers about the status of Poles in terms of culture, in terms of keeping the language, in terms of the, the political freedoms were more or less different. Because we were almost deprived of this specific uh, political freedoms in case of the Russian partition zone and Prussian as well, but of course not in case of Austria. Because especially after the 867, Austria was the most liberal partition zone in our history. That's why sometimes this part, which has been occupied by Austria as the partition zone belonging to Vienna, sometimes used to be called as a Polish Piemont, namely speaking. If there were any speculations about the possibility of starting with the 
uh, let's say, independence process. There was Galicia around Lvov, Stanislavov and uh, other towns located in the, and of course Krakow, located in the southern and eastern part of Poland, uh, which were more or less anticipated as a, a speculated place for the establishment of the Polish state, which was in fact impossible. But if we look upon these three partition zones, they did have unequal political and constitutional status. What is interesting and what is different? In case of uh, Ireland, I presume that the Irish Catholicism should be uh, perceived as the, uh, as the mostly defensive one. In fact, uh, after the Reformation started as a process of the religious change, uh, there were the Irish Catholics, they were having all the time uh, a great problems with the acceptance, with approval from the from the from the English state, because of the uh, uh, stated stated position of the Anglican Church. So, in case of Ireland, we should not say that Catholicism used to be or might be uh, recognized as a certain tool of the uh, more or less a sort of the expansionist like way of thinking. Whereas it was not the case of Poland. Because what I see in the Polish history, what is my own and quite rigid point for the analysis, uh, refers to the issue that until the partition time, until the, until the partition time has started, Polish Catholic Church has always been, of course, very important power in case of, uh, of the Polish Kingdom, in fact, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth of those two nations. But, unfortunately, the Polish Catholic Church was not aware of uh, some important and systemic changes uh, which perhaps would be uh, able to give us a chance to prolong our independent status. Namely speaking, I criticize the Polish Roman Catholic Church for the certain lack of the interest into the reforming Polish state until the end of the 18th century. And again, in that time, Polish Catholicism used to be a sort of the tool for the, for the expansionist like policy in the East, which was not the case of Ireland. But everything has changed after the partition time has started, because Polish Catholic Church, since 795, until the uh, end of the second decade of the 20th century, might be perceived as the very important uh, pillar, a sort of the endorsement for the Polish uh, for the Polish national awareness. So the role of the church, uh, I mean, changed completely from, in my mind, negative one into the positive one. Because you and thanks the church, we were able to keep our national awareness during the partition times. And this is important virtue for the, for the church. So we should also observe the quantitative and qualitative differences in terms of the both nations' immigrant communities, because as we know, the Irish uh, ethnic community, especially in the United States, but also in, of course in Britain and Australia and New Zealand, they used to be very important factors for the politics uh, observable in those places in the world, in the globe. The problem always lies in the in the in numbers because, as we know, Irish uh, are sometimes recognized those who are of the Irish descent, Irish origin, and who live in states. They are sometimes uh, calculated as to be as to form a community for more than 44 billions of people even today. But as far as I know, everything depends on the methods of uh, quantitative methods, simply speaking. Uh, normally, as far as I recall from some of the sociological works, there was this sort of the prerequisite to say that everyone who has at least one eighth of uh, Irish blood in its veins might be called the son of the Irish descent. I mean, in such circumstances, almost everyone might be, <laughs> might be Irish. In, in, in the United States, even as far as I know, Barack Obama has some Irish, Irish face. So. This is really interesting ideological approach. 
But nevertheless, we might say that uh, as far as the Polish community in states is concerned, we have approximately 9 to 10 million so people who are the, of the Polish descent. So this is much, much less than those who constitute the Irish community in contemporary states even. And not talking about the fact that the Polish immigrant community in states, but also in Canada and Australia, has never been able to reach the same position as Irish did. Because Irish were involved very strongly in politics. Irish were able to produce altogether more than 15 different persons who, were of, uh, who, who finally became American presidents. It was not the case of any poll. We were unable to be an important uh, pressure group in terms of the ethnic specific features. So we're not been, we have we're not able absolutely, I mean, to imitate to set the way Irish position within the American political system. This is a great difference, absolutely a difference. <coughs> and uh, of course, Irish were they suffered a lot after they started to come to states, especially during the very great uh, famine time and after. But because they did not have a capital, they didn't have the money. The only chance for them to promote themselves was, to, of course, to become politicians. That's why, and policemen. There are two <laughs> categories uh, which we may observe in terms of Irish and uh, Irish community in careers uh, within the America, so United States of America, uh, especially uh, in the second half of the 19th century. Nevertheless, the role of the both communities is much, much different, of course, and this is in advance and in favor for Irish, not for Polish. What is really interesting, and to a certain extent it has to be mentioned, is the fact that, the, uh, in fact, the Irish, uh, as people speaking their own language, in a great mass of people, I would say, until the, until the famine, they almost lost the chance to use Irish as a language spoken by the vast majority of people. As far as I recall some of the statistical data, there is approximately 25 to 30 percent of Irish who may speak Irish, but who do not want to do it, even today. I remember when I was, uh, as a student many years ago, when I was traveling across Connemara and Bergen, some remote places in the West, I was uh, having some travels, I must say, to communicate in English with the people living there because they were, they were really mostly Irish speakers. But this is very unique. This is very unique. And I remember a nice, uh, uh, funny story when I, when I got a lift from the young couple from England. They were very much uh, happy that I was not Irishman because they taught me that you know, I mean, this is impossible for them to talk to those people there in proper English. So I was also very satisfied that I was able to give my, uh, my hand <laughs> to, to, to English tourists at the time. But what is really fascinating in case of uh, Ireland, that Ireland and Irish are still able, of course, to keep their own culture and come back to their roots, but unfortunately not with the revitalization of, of this uh, language, unfortunately. But uh, despite very many efforts of almost every government in Ireland after the proclamation of the Irish Free State, whereas in case of Poland we might find fortunately uh, as fortunate uh, aspect that we were able to preserve and to keep our language as alive, and we still may speak Polish uh, on the easy way. Although of course Polish language today is uh, full of the different words taken from from other languages, mostly from English. Sometimes it's very it's like newly created Creole language. So uh, if you look especially at those people who speak in large corporations, they may have, and they use in fact, uh, uh, this sort of the vocabulary which is not understandable sometimes even for such, uh, let's say, no. persons like me. Because I try to be very open, but sometimes if you look upon some of the words which are used right now, in the Polish language that are mostly taken from English. And they, I think they do not fit properly to uh, our Polish tradition, which is more or less a slight, quite conservative one. But uh, I mean, this sort of, of conservatives I like because I think that language 
is a very important, is a core issue of Irish culture. So uh, the fact that Irish were unable, as I said, despite the fact that almost every Irish government uh, was trying, of course, all the time to uh, revitalize this language. This is uh, more or less a very specific and uh, very unhappy tradition in the um, Irish independent uh, statehood uh, since 1922. And there was also the different nature of both states' independent birth. In fact, statistically saying, I mean, Ireland and Poland were having and they were looking for the chance almost in the same period. In 1918, very famous elections in, mm -hmm. in, for the British, uh, British House of Commons from the 14th of December 1918 until the proclamation, official proclamation of the, the first uh, Irish constitution of the Irish Free State in 1922, on the 6th of December 1922. But in case of Poland, uh, we started our independence from the very famous day of the 11th of November, and we were continued to, uh, to maintain this process. In fact, until 1922-23, because in, there was in 1923 the last, uh, the last important event which uh, meant that we were able to absorb finally or incorporate the Upper Silesia to the Polish territory. So the process of the formation of a new state and its territory uh, had been more, more or less than, than five years. In fact, Ireland was the youngest democracy for many, many decades, uh, namely until the, until the uh, uh, autumn of nations or fall of nations in 1989, when the new democracies were, were proclaimed. Uh, before that, Ireland uh, really was having this very interesting special status. And another difference lies in the fact, as you see, that Ireland has been the only one, the only state in the European circumstances after the First World War, which was uh, finally established not on the ruins of its former oppressor. Because Britain, in fact, was a victorious uh, superpower after the First World War. And despite this fact, Ireland was able, of course, to do it. I mean, this was a great effort. I always talk to my students whenever I want to make my own competitive analysis. This is very interesting, very unique uh, feature which you have to bear in mind, because uh, almost no one in the world, uh, starting from the 1918 up to 1920, was interested in having Ireland as an independent state. No Woodrow Wilson, of course not Lord George, absolutely, but I wonder if you guess who was in favor. Hmm? No, no. Zuzki was completely ignorant about Germany. Germany was definitely in favor of it. Germany, but only on the cards of Germany, but not after. After the collapse of the Second Reich, also Germany was Germany was, was ruined by the revolution. There were no no even even uh, um, a chance. No, no, no. Soviet oh, Russia. I there was Soviet Russia. Lenin proclaimed openly that he is ready to, of course, to, to I mean, to recognize Ireland. Of course, the I was shocked, as you might be, because he did not want to have such such an ally. But anyway, we should bear in mind this very interesting fact, because Woodrow Wilson and all the uh, Irish communities in the United States were absolutely unable to convince an American power of valid to give Ireland a certain a political hand and to give them a chance to be uh, supported by America. America was absolutely, in that sense, and at that special time, uh, uninterested in, in giving Ireland its assistance. This is absolutely the fact. It's quite interesting when you think that they had the influence bigger than the Polish in the politics, and yet uh, Woodrow Wilson supported the Polish case. And didn't speak openly about the Irish case. But we don't have to be naive and silly because one moment, Paul. Woodrow Wilson was very he was very good politician for Americans, of course. He was one of the most interesting politicians in the 20th century. But he was I mean any any good politician might be very cynical, unfortunately, I must say. Like Churchill. Mm -hmm. I always quote I no, I admire Churchill as, as a great uh, politician in Britain, but I really don't like him as someone who was making his tricky games in case of Polish. So this is, I mean, there are two different approaches, we have to bear in mind this fact. So from the, let's say, my own ethno-national point of view, 
I, I can't I can't be uh, admire. I, yes I can't I can't admire Churchill but of course as being a political scientist as an analyst of course I have to say openly that he was really very effective politician so this was the case of Wilson who suddenly didn't want to have any sort of the troubles with Lloyd George and any any other further uh, British politicians at the time. Yes, Paul, please. Well, just one thing about Wilson. He was of uh, Scots Presbyterian descent, and he, he was very much uh, thought of himself and linked with the Ulster cause. He was much more sympathetic to the Ulster cause than to the Southern Irish. And uh, the other thing about it is that during the, just after the First World War, Domowski, I think it was, came to him with a, a map of what he proposed Poland, and uh, Wilson was horrified by the gigantic sways of Europe that Domowski was demanding. <laughs> Is the one part of Europe you don't want, Mr. Domowski? Uh, apparently, is what he said. Thank you very much for reminding me. This is very interesting, Pagasos. Let me supplement this interesting uh, interruption you made in a very positive way. Uh, with one interesting fact, I mean, would you imagine that uh, also Lloyd George was very strongly against any Polish demands, there was any Polish demands, because he was unfortunately a very bad geographer. He unfortunately once stated openly that he is absolutely unable to, uh, to be satisfied with the Polish demands concerning the territory called Silesia. The problem lies in the fact that Silesia is a Turkish province located in Turkey. Silesia, however, the upper Silesia, is a territory which has been occupied by Germans uh, and slightly by Austrians until the uh, First World War. So Lord George simply was, was sorry to say, he was, he was stupid enough, of course, not to recognize, not to make a difference between Silesia and Silesia because of the very similar pronunciation of those two words. This is the case again, and uh, I must say I sometimes I'm 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 trying to be very much malicious because whenever I have a chance to talk to the British audience, I I like to remind this this special <laughs> fact about the, about the job. Okay, and now the second part of my uh, lecture, I want to concentrate on the nature of the government and nations' alterations, which you may notice as my own analysis. In the case of Ireland and Poland after the Great War. In fact, if we, if we come to the Irish case, there was almost an interrupted parliamentary democracy system with alterations of the state's names and nature. And this is very fascinating for me as a political scientist because in that case, uh, you may find very many uh, miscalculations or let's say misinterpretations, in fact, concerning the Irish, uh, the name of the Irish state. We know for sure that the first proclamation was the Sostat Iran, Irish Free State, as a formal British dominion until 1937, namely until the proclamation of the constitution, which uh, finally uh, uh, changed or amended, not changed, sorry, amended the former constitution from 1922, and constitution which is very well known within the Irish uh, political tradition as a constitution of De Valera, because he was a very strong supporter of this change in the, in the nature of the state. And what is important, the name Aaron, which has been adopted at the time, is more or less an official name until now. But uh, uh, Aaron has remained non-verbally, however, in until 1949, because of the uh, because of the uh, enactment of the new Act of, about Republic, which finally has been accepted and approved by the Doyle in 1948 and afterwards in 1949 with the proclamation about Republic. The Irish, Irish Treaty of 6 December 1921 resulted, as you of course know, in dividing the nationalistic movement into the treaty supporters, the subject ones as well as those who considered it a lesser evil. You are familiar with the very famous uh, expression of uh, Michael Collins, whom I must frankly say I like him more than De Valera, and I'm not original, I love it. Although I don't like the, the uh, movie of Neil Jordan in terms of the historical fact, because this is the Hollywood like movie, and I noticed immediately about 10 to 12 different mistakes, historical mistakes, although the movie has been very nicely made. Anyway, Collins was strongly in favor of 
stepping stone like the uh, process of uh, having Irish independence and so he was much more or less, more or less an evolutionary politician after the undersigning of the Treaty of 1921 what is uh, Emil de Valera or he, as he has been called as a chief at the time he has been more or less uh, uninterested in any sort of the uh, changing the previous previous ideology of the Republican movement. You know exactly, I mean, what were the results, I'm not going to say because everyone knows exactly this whole, what's happened after. But what you should know that this dramatic outcome of uh, uh, the situation was a civil war, and in fact, this was a very strange sort of the civil war, because there were not very many victims, in fact, much less than 1,000 persons. Of course, everyone who lost his or her relatives was in a tragedy, was in depression. But historically saying in statistics, it was not large loss in terms of the of the or especially if you compare this civil war with the uh, say civil war with, in Russia, in Finland, or afterwards in Spain. But this devastation and especially the death of its main leaders on both sides, I mean it did have and I would say for the for the uh, century.